Good afternoon to our most valued invited guests, seniors, colleagues, and students. Welcome to today's session, COVID-19 and Oral and Systemic Mycosis, which is curated by Asian Society of Oral and Mexofacial Pathology under the dynamic leadership of Dr. Kate Onganathan, who's the honorary president of Asian Society of Oral and Mexofacial Pathology. It has been around one and a half years since COVID pandemic engulfed the whole world and the associated superinfections such as mucormycosis or the black fungus disease has also led to renewed interest in the rapidly escalating fungal infections. To discuss and deliberate on the dreaded mycosis, we have with us today the foremost authority on oral fungal infections, Professor Lakshman Samarnaike, who's Professor Emeritus of Microbiomics, an internationally renowned clinical academic with expertise in diagnostic clinical microbiology and research, who has received numerous accolades for his research and contribution to dentistry. The presentation will review the current data on systemic and oral fungal diseases and their relevance on the clinical and dental practice today. Today's session is chaired by Professor W. M. Tilakratne, who's the past president of International Association of Oral Pathologists and founder member and advisor of Asian Society of Oral and Mexofacial Pathology. I now invite the honorary president, Dr. Ranganathan, for the welcome address. Thank you, uh, Dr. Simitri. Uh, a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you uh, in whichever part of the world we are logged in from. It gives me great pleasure on behalf of the Asian Society of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology to extend a warm welcome to you all to this session. Uh, we're going to be talking about a very, very important topic, uh, namely mucormycosis uh, in the setting of the current pandemic. And it's indeed an honor to have a leading expert in uh, microbiology who's going to address uh, this gathering and share with us his experience. I'm sure it's going to be very useful to all of you. Uh, with, uh, a warm welcome to you, Professor Lakshman Samanayake, and to the chairperson, Professor Philip Ratney. Uh, with this brief welcome, let me hand over the mic to Professor Philip Ratney, who's the chairperson for this session. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Ranganathan, and of course, uh, uh, Dr. Simapret. Uh, yes, as uh, Dr. Simapret said, I think we are in a lockdown in the whole world for one and a half years. But despite that, we managed to have a lot of continuing education programs uh, all around the world. Actually, to tell you the truth, I think uh, more than what we had in the non-pandemic era. Uh, because you can listen to any of the world experts uh, in any given week or month. So that's an advantage. That's a good side of COVID. Right? So we, in other words, the flip side of COVID. So we, are, we created a lot of opportunities, etc. Now, uh, I'm happy that uh, Asian Society of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology has taken a lot of steps to disseminate the knowledge to our members and other relevant clinical dental academics and the clinicians. So that's a, that's a very good uh, initiative that the ASOMP has taken. Uh, while thanking both uh, President, Secretary, and the committee, let me start the proceedings. Now, my main task today is to introduce uh, Professor Lakshman Samarnayaka, our good friend for many decades. Uh, I'm, I'm very sure that uh, Professor Samarnayaka does not need any introduction to this forum, for that matter, any international forum. However, uh, as a 
formality, uh, let me uh, introduce him. But I'm again telling you, uh, if I want to read his CV, I need uh, more than a couple of hours. Professor uh, Lakhman Samaranayaka carries so many degrees and professional qualifications at the end of his name, including the highest academic degree, the DSC from University of Peradeniya. In addition, he has DDS, FRC path, FDS, RCS, and various other degrees who, uh, that you all are aware of. Uh, the Professor Samarnayaka is an internationally renowned clinical academic with expertise in microbiomics, that is his main area, clinical research, and more importantly, that most people do not have when it comes to research, uh, is the senior executive level administrative experience. And also he has a lot of interest and he has done a lot of work on dental pedagogy. Now, he is one of those dental academics in the world where publication, publication is, you know, when it comes to publication, it's enormous, it's very regular uh, throughout last few decades. He has published over 450 scientific papers. So that's a massive number. And to make the value of those publications, those papers have been cited by more than 27,000 times by others with the H index of 90, which is, I don't know any other dental academic. There may be very few, if at all in the world, having H index of 90. He was the Dean of two main dental schools in the world, University of Hong Kong, where he completed two terms and he managed to uplift the standards of Hong Kong uh, Dental School within his two terms to become the number one ranked dental school in the world. That is quite an uh, achievement. And also he spent one term of deanship at Brisbane, Australia. Now, what is more specific about Professor Samaranayaka is the, his affinity and ability and uh, uh, enormous amount of work towards the oral fungal infections. Now he has published more than 350 papers on oral fungal infections. I think the second highest person probably is not even close to. He is considered as the foremost international authority on oral microbiome. So uh, he's a very highly sought after speaker. I have seen him in many international fora and he has addressed professional bodies in over 40 countries and received numerous accolades for his research, including the King James the Fourth Professorship of Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, and also a rare award for somebody to receive is the Distinguished Scientist Award of the International Association of Dental Research, IADR Award. And despite the restrictions during the last one and a half years due to COVID, he has still he has published 25 articles on COVID-19 only. Right? So that speaks his research capacity and his dedication to the subject of microbiology in particular. Without taking much of time, I can talk on for hours on his achievement and his ability in the, uh, the field. But without taking much of your time, let me invite Professor Lakshman Samaranayaka to speak to us on COVID-19 and oral and systemic uh, mycosis. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Lakshman Samaranayaka for taking time to educate us. It's all yours now, Sam, over to you. Okay. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to uh, uh, the colleagues who are listening from different parts of the world. Um, and it is, uh, I'm honored to be uh, at this presentation 
of IAOMP and uh, uh, I think I'm, I have spoken at these events before at the international, uh, there are international meetings, but this is the first webinar I am giving to you through the auspices of IAOMP. So it is my uh, duty, first of all, to thank Professor Ranganathan, uh, uh, who is the, the president of the IAOMP, and the secretary, Dr. Simapreet, who uh, have kindly invited me for this, to do this webinar. And of course, you know, my dear colleague, you know, um, Professor Tilakaratna, we are uh, from Sri Lanka. Uh, and we, uh, and thank you so much, Tilak, for, for that uh, effusive, uh, you know, description of my work. And I'm honored, frankly, honored to be amongst you guys and uh, with a dedicated lot of uh, pathologists and microbiologists and of course, all the colleagues who are all over the world, who have been my staff and students and mentors and mentees all uh, throughout the last uh, 40 or, or odd years. Uh, so um, again, you know, it's a great honor for me to address you all and hopefully, um, you know, inculcate some new knowledge about these nasty fungi, which, uh, which are now, you know, um, creating a, some, I think I would say havoc amongst uh, the COVID-19 patients who are COVID infected. So, um, so, so my presentation is, uh, let me share the screen first. Um, is, uh, uh, yeah, so COVID-19 and oral and systemic mycosis. So as Prof. Tilak has, uh, Tilak Ratna has just mentioned, I have been in this business of talking with fungi for the last 30 or 40 years. I can still recall when I started my uh, work on Canada uh, for my PhD or the doctorate degree at the University of Glasgow uh, in 1980s, one of the guys, this is the beginning of, uh, end of 1970s, beginning of 80s, one of my senior professors came to me and said, Sam, why are you uh, studying this dead fungus? You know, why don't you do uh, some bacteria or something in the oral cavity causing periodontitis? And I was really taken back and I was um, quite surprised. Um, and I went to my mentor, Professor McMullen, and he said, look, you know, so-and-so said to me, you know, and I'm a um, little bit, uh, you know, disappointed. Shall I continue? Prof. McFarlane said, because nobody is working on this. So you are the, if you are working on this particular subject, you, know, you can create a name for yourself. And just to cut a short story long, short, long story uh, short, 1981 was the kind of middle of my PhD and then HIV happened. And uh, with the HIV, you know, the whole story of oral candidiasis and, you know, it, it shot up into the, the stratosphere, the numbers of publications. And, and I think that's what really grabbed my attention and what created a fantastic opportunity for me to, uh, you know, dabble in oral mycology, as we say here, uh, you know, oral mycosis. So, uh, so that is a little bit of my history into, into uh, this Canada, you know, the arena of oral mycology. And so since then, I have published quite a number of uh, papers on this. And uh, so I really love this organism. And then, then fungi, uh, you know, I, I uh, attach great importance to it. And then, of course, the COVID-19 coming back to today and the uh, pandemic has created another uh, kind of buzz about systemic mycosis mycosis, and of course, uh, with the, in India in particular, about this black fungus disease. So without further ado, let me get on to my presentation. So this is how I'm going to, um, uh, uh, the key topics of my presentation, some introductory remarks. And I will, first of all, uh, discuss about some general oral manifestations of, in relation to COVID-19. Um, and then subsequently, we'll get on to the, um, uh, the oral candidiasis, which is seen in, uh, in this uh, COVID-19. So let's call it the white fungus disease. And in this connection, I would like to particularly address 
a specific organism, which I'm sure being pathologist, or indeed if you're not pathologist, you may have heard of this organism, it's called the Candida auris. And this is, I want to actually uh, touch on this specific new emerging Candida for reasons you will understand in a minute once I complete my presentation. Then we will get on to the, the black, going from the white to the black, which is the, the mucomycosis. And then um, a little bit on other systemic mycosis that are particularly not present in the oral cavity. So the mucomycosis and the candidiasis are present in the oral cavity in COVID-19. Uh, uh, COVID so therefore I will be devoting 90% of my presentation on this. And the other one, aspergillosis, just a couple of slides only. And then we will do some uh, concluding remarks. So this is just the, the key topics which I'm going to discuss uh, uh, now on for the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, just to go uh, take a little bit back on this, um, before COVID struck uh, you know, the world as, as it were, there was another coronavirus, I'm sure all of you know, SARS coronavirus in 2003. And then I was in the right in the middle of it because as you know, it was the epicenter of SARS coronavirus infection was Hong Kong and China, you know, Shenzhen and so on. So we had 299 people dying. We had the largest number of deaths for that disease and so on and so forth. Fortunately, it uh, it uh, abated, and I didn't. Nobody knows the reason why it abated, uh, but once for one reason or uh, more, it it just died a death. So, uh, and then during that time, we faced a huge challenge in Hong Kong, facing this coronavirus infections, and actually that has really helped us to curb the the current COVID nineteen because just now for the last eight weeks or so, we don't have a single infection community transmission of COVID infection. So now if you look at this, this slide of mine, um, this is something which I wrote with uh, Professor Piris, who is also, uh, who discovered, uh, co-discoverer of the coronavirus in Hong Kong, uh, who is also from Sri Lanka and my, my co-microbiologist. And we wrote in, a JAD, in JADA, uh, in a review of, of coronavirus disease and um, dentistry, uh, and we said this, the dental community cannot let down its guard and must be constantly aware of impending infectious threats in various guises, as well as recrudescence of disease that may challenge the current infection control regime. Unfortunately, you know, this is in 2004 in JADA, and uh, lo and behold, in 2020, 2019, 16 years later, we were struck with another uh, terrible, terrible coronavirus, which is, which, is, uh, which is now creating the havoc all over the world. And nobody really thought that this could spread to this extent, but here you, we are at this critical juncture where we are trying to control this nasty organism, uh, which is coming in various guises, as I said here, you know, now we have the Delta variant, then the Lambda variant in so many waves and so on and so forth. So that was uh, just a premonitory um, saying we had, and, but unfortunately that came, came to be true. That's a little bit unfortunate. Well, coming back to today, the global numbers, I don't want to tell you, you must be bored with these numbers. So just one slide of this. 188 million, four, over 4 million deaths. And then there are second waves and third waves and people are in some countries, they are saying now we are having the third wave and then will there be a fourth wave? And then there are viral variants, as I said, the Lambda variant and the you know, Delta variant um, and, and so on and so forth. You know, these nasty viruses um, always have a way of keeping one step, step ahead of the scientists and the humanity. They are one step ahead all the time. So, so we have to be extremely careful and we have to learn lessons from this particular disease. Uh, so we let's get on to the, the more focus uh, more deeply into the oral manifestations. So as uh, uh, 
Professor Silakaratna mentioned, I have been writing a series of articles. Uh, it's called the COVID Commentary to the Dental Update, which is the general practitioner's journal for dentistry in the UK, which has a huge circulation. So this is, uh, I, I wrote, this is my 12th, I think, COVID article. I told the editor of general Dental Update more than one year ago, you know, um, this is uh, Professor Trevor Burke from Birmingham. I said, Trevor, you know, I, I would like to do a commentary on this and uh, maybe a monthly column on it. He said, yeah, Sam, please do it because you have done this before for the AIDS and you wrote about five or six articles and I still recall it. And this is my now the 10th article on oral manifestation on COVID and related to dentistry. It's, I wrote about disinfections. Uh, the latest article is on the uh, the 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 side diagnostics of COVID and so on and so forth. So so this in the oral manifestations of coronavirus disease, I together with prof, uh, two others, uh, Dr. Nihal Bandar and Dr. Fakhrudin, we we tried to collect all the data up to now on COVID and oral manifestations. So. And we couldn't find too much data on it, but having said that, so we managed to, uh, uh, you know, sum up all this in a summary. As you all know, COVID-19 is a multi-system, all-pervasive disease, so-called protein manifestations. Uh, what we mean by protein manifestations are diseases like syphilis and HIV, which actually ramifies and manifests in all parts of the body. So we all know the major signs of COVID, dry cough, pneumonia, and so on and so forth. And then, however, the mucocutaneous manifestations of COVID, particularly those of the oral cavity, are not well known. So the question is whether there are oral orofacial manifestations of COVID. But up to now, there are not too many reports. I mean, the disease is rampant. You know, it's all over the world, all five continents, right? But one would imagine if there were oral manifestation, there would be like, for example, in HIV, we had hairy leukoplakia and a huge amount of oral thrush and oral thrush was a premonitory sign of HIV and so on and so forth. And the Greenspans the, in, in California found these things at the very beginning in 1980s. So, uh, so why are there no oral manifestations? So uh, we are being speculative. It could be due to the uh, poor detection by the physicians and you know, uh, without uh, being offensive, I, I, as we all know, physicians really don't look at the mouth you know, when the patients come in, you know, most of them at least. Uh, so uh, it could be due to the poor detection or due to the other major, major systemic presentations such as cough and difficulty breathing. They, they don't want to look at the mouth. They just intubate the patients and so on and so forth. So, uh, however, there are a few systematic reviews available. Um, and when you look at through this lot, they are mostly anecdotal in nature. Uh, in nature. So, uh, so, for example, this is the table from my particular uh, article. I'm not, not expecting you to read this, but uh, there are oral manifestations, but I would say they are anecdotal and we can't be sure that it is specifically due to COVID or due to something else. So what are the mucocutaneous manifestations? Before we get on to the, 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 the mycological manifestations, so these uh, comprise uh, from my uh, from our review ulcers and erosions. You get herpetiform uh, and zo uh, zosteriform lesions, lots of white and red patches, and indeed black patches. When you think about the uh, uh, the, the black fungus disease, uh, erythema multiformi-like lesions like target lesions, petechiae and the macular lesions. Then we have seen uh, there are reports of vesicular lesions, pustules, angina bullosa-like lesions, and then some um, necrotizing lesions and uh, non-specific lesions and mucositis. So this is the lot which has been described currently in relation to general oral manifestations of COVID uh, in terms of oral lesions. So, so, and the other thing which we have to remember is one of the earliest signs of COVID is 
uh, dysgeusia, which is uh, alterations in the, on the taste. So uh, a lot of people know that. So then serostomia and dysgeusia and uh, uh, burning mouth sensation, this is, this is very well known, although people are now saying this um, uh, dysgeusia or uh, taste alterations are related to the, uh, uh, these symptoms are related to geographical regions as well. I saw a recent article on, yeah, on this as well, serostomia, dyskeusia, um, and, and so on. Then the ulcerative lesions, blisters, uh, immunosuppression lesions, and then oral thrush. There are, as you will uh, see in a moment, there are some reports of oral thrush as well, um, quite a number. Uh, then the, uh, the white red lesions are here, and these could be oral thrush, uh, oral uh, candle lesions as well. So uh, coming, focusing deeper into the topic which we are discussing, we are into two topics now, uh, leaving about the rest. So these are shown in the arrow, the candidiasis and fungal infections, which is the mu mucomycosis or the black fungal disease. So there are some representative figures and uh, uh, of our patient here, as you can see here. Um, let's uh, just take a one step back, okay? Why are these fungal uh, mucomycosis and black fungal diseases quite common in some parts of the world? Now we know if you look at, these are some general uh, points on fungi. There are estimated, these are estimates, guesstimates rather, 5 million fungal species and about 300 we know cause human disease. So the fungi are essentially affect the human body when there's a host weakness. So, so we, also, we say that these are diseases of the diseased. If you are a young or if you're a healthy, if you're healthy and a robust person, you will hardly get any fungal disease because the fungi, our immune system is armed so that they can kill all the fungi which invade us, despite the fact that they are all over the place, as I will show you in the next slide. So the fungal infections are usually seen in the very young because their immune system is not very mature and the very old, uh, when again the immunity wanes and sometimes they, are, they have other collateral diseases and in the very sick. So this is a, a aphorism which we use in, in candidiasis and this applies to COVID as well, the very young, the very old and the very sick. So you remember this. So, uh, so, the, so the, the, this is, uh, these are some general things about fungi. So oral mycosis in relation to COVID uh, are due to the essentially the use of broad spectrum antibiotics and steroids. And we know very well now the steroids are becoming very, very popular such as dexamethasone for treatment of uh, COVID. Um, and, uh, um, and then also you can get oral fungal infection during the hospital, hospital say, uh, so-called nosocomial infections. And of course, these uh, ordinary fungal infections, uh, uh, like even candidiasis, can be treated with antifungal drugs. So the most common fungal infections, according to CDC, from their records, are three things, the candidiasis, mucomycosis, which is an aspergillosis. Now, uh, mucomycosis and candidosis are the most common, and as aspergillosis uh, is less common, although there is a debate on which, which one is more common. I mean, this is changes on a daily basis on the number of reports we are getting from the uh, various regions of the world. And so, uh, so let's, uh, so, after finishing these two oral manifestations. So I'm not going to talk about any more oral manifestations, but I'm going to focus on oral candidiasis. So let's call the white fungus disease and then go on to candida auris and then uh, discuss, discuss in detail the mucomycosis. So the next 30 minutes or so, so we'll be, we'll be discussing these, these, uh, these topics. So it's COVID-19 and oral candidiasis. Now, as you know, the candida infections in the oral cavity, um, uh, I call them the candida uh, triad manifestation. It's essentially the pseudomembranous, which is the thrush, 
the erythematous or the red patch, pseudomembranous or the white patch, or the again, the hyperplastic variant, the third one. So in COVID, the hyperplastic variant is, is, is not seen um, for one reason or another. I don't want to go in there. But, but essentially, we see the pseudomembranous and the erythematous variants of the fungal infections. And then there are these, these are some of the clinical pictures. And I have to tell you, you know, I am, uh, I have not sort of uh, stopped uh, being a, a clinician a long time ago. I was in a mainly clinical laboratories. This is a, a study of oral lesions uh, from Favia and so on from a Bari. And uh, that's a clinical and histopathological study uh, of 123 patients. So these are the uh, examples which I have taken from that particular study uh, showing the white lesions, uh, which is here, which is shown here, although I'm a little bit suspect uh, whether this, uh, this is real fungal. Then you get the red lesions, the pseudomembranous patches and the, and the, um, the erythematous patches, and also deep papillation, which is very commonly associated with fungal infections and red tongues as well. And then uh, they also show in the next slide, I'll show you uh, uh, the, uh, then there's another series which has been reported as I uh, mentioned to you, we did, 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 did a um, uh, systemic uh, um, review on this. And this is by Riyad, uh, uh, who uh, ha has uh, reviewed the evidence for uh, oral candidiasis in, in COVID patients. and. Here we have a fully blown, this is from that particular uh, article, fully blown thrush in this patient. And then there's a, uh, there's a so, um, uh, erythematous patch here. And here possibly angular chelitis, you can get chelitis due to candida infection. And this is intraoral shot, which is not that clear uh, in this. So the, these fungal infections are very, very common uh, relatively common in COVID patients, and particularly those who are on steroid therapy, um, which is uh, given, you know, to suppress the immune system because they when they overreact and cause lots of problems with COVID. So these are some of the studies from that Baria study: 63 cases, 84% uh, from the Middle East, 11 from the Europe, 11%, uh, 3% uh, roughly from Latin America from and 1% uh, from Africa. So these numbers are just, just for your, uh, these are about to change because these the every day people are reporting these infections and more and more reviews and more and more collections of case reports are coming up. Uh, the female to male ratio in that, that particular series of 56 to 43 and the mean age was, I mean, of course, uh, the disease was is found in older people. So it's not surprising that the, they are found in, you know, this kind of older age, age categories. So a uh, minority of these patients had comorbidities, uh, such as, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 diabetes and other, other, other diseases. And most of them presented with pseudomembranous candidiasis from the tongue dorsum and on the oral mucosa. And uh, usually the antifungal protocols for use for them was uh, systemic fluconazole uh, therapy with or without oral nystatin. Now, nystatin and amphotericin B are the poly, polyene anti, antifungals, which are very effective for treating um, uh, you know, uh, the uh, oral candidiasis, because these nystatins are, they have a very heavy molecular weight. And uh, however much you give uh, to the patient, they are not absorbed through the, the gut. So whatever you give is kind of uh, comes out from the other end. So nystatin is a very safe drug and still very, very effective against candida. Of course, you get others like candida glabrata and various other species coming up, which are nystatin resistant. Now, the fluconazole came up about 2015. Uh, Nystatin was discovered in 1950s in the New York State, and it's, that's why it's called NYSTAT, New York State. And, uh, but fluconazole was the, the, the azole category drug, which we call the ma uh, magic bullet drug. Uh, 
um, which the azole group of drugs are the mainstay of antifungal agents currently. And this is very good. And you will see later on for the other mucomycosis also, we can use the uh, new gen next generation uh, azole drugs as well. And uh, so, so that is a little bit about the oral candidiasis. That's what's in the literature. Uh, I, can, I can assure you, you don't get more than that. Uh, this was a review which we did, did uh, uh, a couple of months ago. So essentially you can re rest assured that what you get is pseudomembranous and erythematous candidiasis in these patients. Now let's talk about Candida auris. This is a very, very interesting organism. Why is it interesting? Because I say that Candida auris is, is an organism which is uh, spreading around the world, and I call it the silent pandemic. So um, I have not seen this being called this, but I would call it the silent pandemic. And you will see now in a, in a moment why it's called. So Candida auris is a special strain of Candida, uh, which was species of Candida, which was described in 2009. I'll show this in a moment. And it causes outbreaks of severe infections in healthcare facilities with, uh, and causes huge amount of mortality. Um, uh, and then once, so I said it came up to the, uh, you know, it was uh, discovered in 2009 in Japan. I have a slide on this in a moment. I'll share it with you. But with the COVID-19 pandemic, outbreaks breaks of CREs have been seen and more and more in acute care hospitals. And for example, the fungal division of the CDC, the chief of that, realized during the COVID you know, uh, pandemic during the, in, in, uh, in LA, Los Angeles, they are reporting this new problem. So some of these patients had developed additional infection with a fungus called, this is a new fungus called Candida auris. And the important thing is it resisted treatment by most of the few antifungals which are available. You see, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we do not have uh, we do not have lots of antifungals as in comparison to antibacterials. We have got only about five or six good groups of antifungals. And if we run out of them, then we are in real, real trouble. So that is one of the biggest problems with treatment of fungi. So, and the other problem with Candida auris is this guy can survive on cold, hard surfaces and resist disinfectants. So what does that mean? If they get into a hospital, they will be there forever. So it's very, very difficult to get rid of them. And they cause nosocomial infection, or hospital infection, and cause fast spreading outbreaks and kills up to two thirds of the people who contracted it, particularly in a hospital, um, hospital ecosystem. So this is why it's bad, bad news for quite a lot of uh, you know, physicians who are treating Canada auris. So why are we worried? Essentially, these four facts. It causes serious infections. It is multi-drug resistant and resistant to the few antifungals we have. And now spreading to common in all continents. And to top it all, this is difficult to identify in a laboratory system without special equipment. And, uh, and then, what does it do? It colonizes patients for months, persists in the environment, and resists disinfectants. So there you are. So this is a recipe for a fantastic fungus to survive in our human body. So this guy is highly, highly resistant to you know, all the paraphernalia, the instrumentation, all the you know, armamentarium we have to kill fungi. So uh, people are wondering why this was uh, becoming more common. Uh, in, in some parts of the world. Uh, and this could be related to change, particularly in the COVID situation. And uh, there are, these are the speculative, uh, uh, you know, speculations on this. It could be limited because it's, it's lying on surfaces, limited availability of gloves and gowns and reuse of these items and the poor disinfection practices due to the heavy 
wars due to the heavy uh, you know covid 19 patients in the wards and various other patients and uh, and as i said uh, uh, the identification of c auris is very very difficult and it's like a just a ordinary run of the mill candida albicans so when you send the specimen to the lab they will say it's candida albicans and you don't identify unless you have specific identification measures Okay, so going back, take a, taking a step back, so Canada Oris is a global fun, a health threat. And as I said, it was reported from an external in 2009 for a, from an ear discharge in Japan, in a Japanese lady. And that's from ear. So the original I said from uh, Oris, although people say that it has been lying around from 2004 onwards, just like some of these HIV and so on and so forth. Anyway, so that's why it's called candida auris. Auris meaning the ear infection, right? So remember this, and uh, this is something which we have to face in the future. It's a name you are going to hear more and more, unfortunately, if this pandemic lasts. And here we go. So 2009, it was isolated from Japan. Uh, and you can see the spread of Canada auris. This is from Current Opinion Microbiology, a review on the epidemiology of Canada auris. Huge amount of papers on Canada auris. We recently uh, wrote a paper on this, uh, on, we are writing with one of my colleagues, and uh, there are about you know, 60, 70 papers on, on, on the Canada auris about all these, uh, they are persistent. So you can see the spread from essentially from Asia to the South America and then going to North America and spreading all around the world. Now you can see it's virtually in all parts of the world where you can test for it. And God only knows what happens in other parts of the world where it can be tested, cannot be tested because of the specific requirements which are required for, which is essential for testing. So this is why I call it the, the silent silent pandemic, so this is a C or is pandemic. And so uh, it's been reported now in over 20 countries. And uh, fortunately for us who are healthy, it's found mainly in critically ill and immunocompromised. You know, remember that age, very young, the very old and the very sick. And up to half, 50%, 30 to 60 with invasive candida or is infection, have unfortunately died. Uh, so some more about this. So you can see the uh, a little bit more detail here in terms of the current uh, uh, distribution of Canada auris. So the, uh, I don't know whether you can see this properly. So this, the green is a uh, single Canada auris case reported. This is like one year ago. So this may be, this has to be upgraded. Unfortunately, there are no new uh, maps on this. And then the um, transmission of multiple cases of Oris, you can see in uh, America, North America, and in Russia, and in, in uh, China, and so on, and Australia. And then um, Oris cases linked to healthcare stays in these countries. So, uh, stay, so yeah, here you can see the India coming up here, South Africa, and some of the um, South American countries and so on and so forth. So it's it's kind of spreading all over the world, and and uh, with the, the more better identification uh, techniques, and unfortunate uh, together with the COVID, we see more and more of this. So I said, what oh, this uh, this this part can the auris is resistant to multiple antifungals. I told you at the beginning we have we don't have too many anti 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 antifungals. We have uh, the pauline group, uh, amphotericin B, nystatin, the, the various azol group anti and antifungals, and then the newer echinocandines, you know? So you could look at this here. So 90% are resist, these candida auris are resistant to fluconazole, which is the, the magic bullet antifungal, which we use in HIV patients and various other patients. And 30% are resistant to amphotericin B, which is amphotericin B is also a really nice drug. But again, you can see uh, systemic, you know, liposomal amphotericin B, they are resistant to 30%. And uh, one of the latest uh, group of drugs, which are called the uh, antifungal drugs, some of you uh, may have heard of this, is called the echinocandines. 
and uh, less than 5%, they are also showing resistance to these, these, these antifungals. So at the bottom, the bottom line here, ladies and gentlemen, is we are running out of these antifungals to treat candida aureus. This is bad news. It's like uh, you have heard about Staphylococcus aureus, which is we are running out of anti antibiotics to read, uh, treat uh, Staph aureus, like for example, um, you know, uh, various uh, Staph aureus species which are resistant to all the available anti 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 antibiotics. Similarly, this candida aureus is becoming a nasty. So, so this is difficult to identify with standard laboratory methods. So this is the this is essentially the crux of the problem. So what are the the classification of candida auris infections? So we have the deep and systemic infections, which are essentially um, uh, this is where you have your uh, patients uh, who are hospitalized patients where they may die. Quite a lot of them may die because of this. And then we have the superficial variant, which can happen in a community situation, right? And if you go on to invasive infection, so uh, you get generalized candidemia, so candida in the blood, blood is called candidemia. Then you can see the nasty pericarditis, pneumonias, and severe urinary tract infections. So this is essentially the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 so the, the systemic infections. And if you look at the superficial infections, you can get wound infections, uh, as you can, I mean, just some, uh, some illustrations here. Uh, nail infections, uh, uh, which is uh, the term for that is paronychia. You can get occasional paronychia due to candida. Then you can get skin infections and oral infections, I would say to with candida auris is uncommon but very few have been described in the literature. I believe this is because not that it's not there, but I think it's because it's not been identified properly and people report it as a white fungus, which is the candida or candida albicans, which is the common one. And that's the reason. So if we, uh, to sum up then, the classification of this is deep and systemic candida auris and superficial you have the pericarditis, pneumonias, UTI, and candidemia, and then the oral wound and skin uh, and nail infections for the superficial infections. So uh, the reasons for this uh, nosocomial transmission in healthcare settings are here. You can get them carriage in healthcare workers' hands. Uh, as I said, survival in hospital environments, plastics, fabrics, non-porous surfaces, and then uh, they survive the disinfection. So these are this is a recipe for disaster and spread. So how do you this sub diagnostic? Uh, because we have a lot of pathologists here, so I have just put some of these diagnostic aspects. Uh, you have to get swabs and smears from the affected area. Then obviously, if you have got these patients in a hospital situation, we have to do environmental sampling of the hospital. Unfortunately you know, fabrics, uh, curtains, uh, surfaces, the door handles, and you name it. And then you have to culture and then identify. It. So uh, in terms of the, 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 the distribution of these uh, Kanda auris, uh, people have, it's just like the variants of the COVID-19, the Kanda auris, they call the clades. So we have the, in, in yellow here, the South Asian clade here, in India and possibly uh, in uh, UAE and Saudi Arabia here, as well as North America. Then you get the East Asian clade too over here in Afghanistan and so on. Uh, and then South African clade and the Australia, where I get it in Australia, uh, South American clade and then unknown and so on in, in this one. So there are four major clades for Kanda auris. Now, uh, you may not know some of you, so I'll just, uh, some, of you, so, uh, some of you who are not in the laboratory um, uh, diagnostics do, do not know about this. In the laboratory, if say there are so many different candida species, albicans, glabrata, crucii, stilatoidea, and so on and so forth. So how do we differentiate initially when you get a swab and we, we streak it on a sabarad zega? Most of them come up with yellow colonies and you cannot differentiate the different colors. But there is a medium called chromega, which you, which you see here. But in chromega, that's why chromega means a different color, chromine color. 
they appear in different colors, like Clubrata in uh, pink, Albicans in white, Cruzii in wrinkle forms, and so on and so forth. So if you take the swab and swab it on Chromega, then you can see uh, quickly that, uh, you know, it's just almost spot identification. You can identify Canada Crucia and Canada Glabrata and all these other species. I don't want to bore you with detail. The point I'm trying to get at is, is that this Chromega, when you culture Canada auris, they appear as white and pink and red and purple. So it's so difficult to differentiate them from the other Canada species. And it's very confusing and it, it confounds the microbiologists in the lab. And uh, so, uh, go back, sorry. So this is, uh, sorry about that. Uh, this is the appearance under the microscope. They do not have germ tubes. I'm sure all of you know the Canada albicans puts up germ tubes. They do not have germ tubes and they are essentially oval shaped organisms. And they are very much similar to Canada, uh, Canada auris as well, uh, Canada albicans. So, uh, so this is the microbiology, a little bit of microbiology. So how do you identify these guys? So Chromega is not reliable. So we have to use, uh, use uh, specific machines called multi-trough identification uh, techniques, which are not available, I must say, in lots of laboratories, particularly in the developing world. I really don't know whether it's available. In, so I come from Sri Lanka, but um, so, so the other Molditoff will give you immediate identification, whereas, uh, uh, but if you don't have, you have to do DNA sequence, sequencing, which is a very, uh, you know, you can't do this in diagnostic laboratory. So this is one of the reasons why we have issues with Canada auris. And uh, very quickly, for those who are interested, why is Canada auris like this? Uh, very persistent, uh, because Canada auris, ladies and gentlemen, um, apparently has a cell wall manan which sticks to the, the, the hair and the skin of people. And this particular brand of the manan, uh, with the, which is here, actually has a, uh, 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 you know, uh, affinity for the hairs and skin. So that may be one reason why people carry it all the time. And uh, these are other postulated Kanda virulence or Auris virulence attributes. Uh, again, I don't want to bore you, uh, essentially related to the, I can just touch here. The, so they may be having so-called efflux pumps. What are these? Right. So this is a, these are very horrifying stories, but I'm sorry to share it with you. There was a 27 year old male treated for COVID-19 by steroid and what Maharashtra hospital, it's swollen and protruding eyes, right? And this guy was having the the muco inside his fungi, inside this uh, sinuses, and it was infecting, invading into both eyes. And the surgeons had to remove both his eyes, a 27-year-old man. And similarly, uh, at Samadana, there's another uh, case report um, in Maharashtra where oral maxillophage uh, surgeons had to, re uh, uh, you know, remove the jaws and so on and so forth. But before going on to that, I just want to show, show you that muco is a very, very old organism. You know, you know Anthony Van Leeuwen Hood, who described the, um, uh, the uh, plaque microorganism, first microbes, um, and he described together with, he did looked at uh, the uh, oral cavity, like he looked at the white plaque and he looked at through his microscope, original microscope. Uh, and similarly, this guy, uh, Robert Hooke, at the same time, in 1665, from uh, Amsterdam, they, they, uh, he described the microfungus called the muco. And, uh, and you can see that he, uh, this is what his picture of the microfungus muco, which is very, very good, uh, good uh, uh, you know, similarity to uh, what you will see in a minute. So it's a very old history. It's been around. These fungi have been around for thousands of years or millions. Here you go. So muco is uh, actually when I was a student in the advanced level, it, uh, I was fascinated with biology, and I was looking at the, this is this is in the bread. 
if you leave it out, you see the, this black fungi growing. So this is muco, and you can see the sporangia 4, which is the, the blackness is due to the, this sporangia 4. So, so, uh, so it's, it's been there for ages and it's, uh, it's, it's all around us. So these mucomycosis are previously called psychomycosis and, um, and it causes uh, opportunistic infections, as I said here earlier, in sinuses, brain or lungs. And due to the, they are due to the mucoral, this is a detail of it. Okay. So, I mean, if you look at the condition in India, um, um, uh, this is fungal spores. They are all over. You know, they, we breathe all them all the time, but thankfully our immune system is so good. They take care of it. So, so we have, these are the numbers. You can read them. 800 to 4,800 4, spores per cubic meter. So five to 10 fungal species dispersed in the air. So every person on the planet, they say these are guesstimates, inhales at least 1,000 fungal spores. They are, they are inhale, inhale, you inoculate them, but once you inoculate, nothing happens. Uh, fortunately, they don't take root in the gut and uh, rather when you ingest it and even inoculation is not going to work. So, so they are all over, they are all over. So you can't avoid them. So that's the, that's the, that's the question. So uh, in general features, are, as I said, they are particularly seen in the soil, very moist environments. Muco loves to grow in moist environments. That's why they get the bread and in decaying substances, compost files and uh, uh, rotting wood and so on. But important thing for you to realize, it's a non-contagious disease, it's not a virus. Uh, it's unless, if you are well, you know, you will not get it. If you are unwell, of course, you have to be very careful. Uh, it cannot, cannot be transmitted by direct or indirect contact. Um, so unfortunately, I think most of, uh, most of these listeners today are from India. Quite a lot of these reports are from India. And I have seen other cases from different parts of the world, like South America. But, uh, and these are called now COVID-associated mucomycosis, so CAM, they are called CAM. This is an acronym for that. Um, why it's found in India, 70%, I really don't know. It's the research aren't clear. There are a lot of speculations. I don't want to go there now. So it's a serious but rare opportunistic fungal infections. It can be fatal. Uh, they say up to 50 to 80 percent of patients could die if not diagnosed and treated early. So the, the trick is to diagnose early and treat early and before they took before they take root in you in yourself. And um, usually seen in people uh, where our immune system is affected with COVID-19 or other severe viral diseases in immunodeficiency cancers and in immunosuppressive medications, right? So here you go. I mean, there are a whole list of things. If you're looking at immunosuppressed individuals these days due to modern, uh, modern, modern therapeutic techniques, a lot of people are uh, immunodiagnosed like hematologic malignancies, and uh, you know, organ transplantations, then due to sometimes severe burns and trauma, prolonged corticosteroid therapy, and so on and so forth. So let's get on to the classification of mucomycosis. Uh, essentially, divided into five different types. Probably you don't, you have not heard of this. So you have the pulmonary, which is the first type, uh, which is the lung. The rhinocerebral, which is more related to you know, oral medicine and oral surgery and uh, dentistry. Um, sinus and brain, of course, cutaneous also uh, similar. So these two are uh, related. And uh, uh, sorry, go back, go back. And go back. Trinocerebral, mucocutaneous. So let's talk about the pulmonary. Most common in cancer patients with stem cell or organ transplant, right? Then rhinocerebral, which is patients with uncontrolled diabetes and a kidney transplant patients. Then we have the cutaneous ones, which are skin infections. Uh, fungi enter the body through the burns or you know, any type of skin injury. So, so this is the, you know, if you are not immunocompromised, these are the cutaneous skin infections are, uh, but they are not, they don't spread into the systemic become into the circulation. So they are just superficial and the body gets rid of this uh, within a few weeks. Then you have the gastrointestinal, 
most common among low birth weight babies, and then um, then you have the disseminated infection. Okay, uh, so these are the um, into various places like the heart, spleen, and skin, and so on and so forth. So essentially, these five types are the most the general types. But we don't want to go into all uh, all of these. Let's talk about essentially the rhino cerebral and the possibly the skin. We are we we are. We, our focus should be as 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 dental surgeon. So uh, rhinocerebral variant is uh, is very very nasty, particularly in COVID nineteen patients, and they have to be diagnosed early and treated treated early. Otherwise, very very poor prognosis and early diagnosis can be life saving, right? Uh, even in the early stage, they could be very very difficult to treat. So the symptoms are, for example, headache, uh, multiple, multiplicity of symptoms, headache, fever, facial, sinus or nasal pain, um, redness or skin about the sinuses. Uh, in the late stages, you can get black nasal discharge, one-sided swelling of the upper uh, jaw, facial paralysis, paralysis occasional. So eyes that swell and protrude, dark scabs inside the nasal cavities when you look through, then you can get toothache or loosening of the teeth because the sinuses invasion and they invade into the, the maxillary alveoli. Black lesions on the palatal area, again, due to the sinus infection and uh, eventually loss of vision, vision. So all these things. So the uh, so skin uh, mycosis, because this is skin, the previous was uh, rhinocerebral. You can get facial uh, pain, serum filled bullae, skin ulcers, uh, infected skin area can turn black, um, warm and excessive reddening area, selling around the infected area, uh, back lesions on the nose of the bridge. Intraoral, you can get facial palatal redness or white lesions or necrotic bone. So a whole host of things uh, you can see. So you have to be careful here. And here it's a case which has been described in the literature. Um, uh, I forget the author of this. We I did the extraction of a tooth and the fungal infection, the mucomycosis. Uh, this is from uh, India. I don't know whether the, um, uh, which, which, which state it is. And then subsequently, after the extraction, the fungus grew from the, the sinuses, uh, maxillary sinuses, and uh, there was, this is a necrotic bone. It's, it's actually after the black state, it becomes white because due, due to the necrotic bone. And here we go, so you can see the, some of the clinical appearances, the white, so this is the dead, uh, this should be the other way around, the red, uh, the, the, the black uh, palatal area, and you can get the, uh, the, the, the unfortunately, the nose, which is uh, possibly due to the, the infection of the sinus uh, protruding through. And this is due to the dead, because what they do is this muco, these fungi, these hyphae, they really block the, uh, the vascular supply to these specific areas and they become like uh, gangrenous and that's why it becomes dead. And then clinical appearance is shown here and there are uh, some of these, uh, again, again, these are some of these uh, clinical photos. I have taken uh, photomicrographs and photos taken from the literature. So what are the diagnostic tools? Early diagnosis is crucial. I can't uh, uh, emphasize this too much. So uh, thorough intraoral and extraoral examination, you can take swabs and smears from specific areas. Radiographic evaluation, if you are, if you are thinking that it is uh, due to uh, sinus infection or invasion. Biopsy and histological examination using KOH staining and then culture of the lesional tissue on the, you know, if you are for fungi, it's on Sabarad Sega in the, in the uh, lab. So this is the classical appearance in the Sabarad Sega. So I'm sure all of you remember your microbiology uh, in the lab. This is a yellow medium, Sabarad dextrose Sega. And you can see, this is the stuff you grow on, the, as I said, which you see on your bread. It's the same kind of appearance. These are the mycelium. Mycelium means the fungus body. It becomes black because of the, the fungal sporangial spores. So you can see this, you see, this is a fungus. And then the sporangia for these are the black bodies. And what they happens is these black bodies, when they open, they, they burst out and, and, and uh, uh, 
uh, you know, throw out millions of spores. And these are the ones you inhale, uh, which comes into the air. And this is the electron micrograph of sporangia for over here, mycelial structure. And if you do a cotton wool, uh, the staining of uh, lactophenol cotton wool staining, you can see the, the very beautiful, uh, you know, the, the, the sporangios, the, the, the stem and the sporangio. These are thousands of, those virtually thousands of spores. And you can see some of the spores. I hope you can see them in this uh, times 40 magnification of these, right? So histologically, as uh, histopathologists, you will see fungal balls, actually, again, I've got a picture, couple of pictures here, characterized by entangled masses of fungal organisms, uh, and in a necrotic exudate with minimal mucosal inflammatory reaction. See, what happens is that when, uh, I told you, this fungus likes humid areas in the body, and particularly uh, when they are uh, sort of, uh, you know, in, in, in the case of when there's uh, uh, people who are uncontrolled diabetic, when there's sugar in the, in the excess, excess uh, sugar, they love sugar as well. And they love uh, humid, moist spaces. So that's where they love to grow into the nasal cavity. They, once they grow into the nasal cavity, they start multiplying. And however much antifungals you give, you can't reach the center of the nasal cavity. Can you imagine that? So once, once they get hold of the, the nasal cavity and rather the sinus, sinus, sinus cavities, they, they just grow forever. And to get rid of them, you have to give antifungals for weeks on end. So, uh, so fungal cultures are often negative and uh, because you need specific conditions for their growth. So this is some of the histopathology you can see from a fungus ball. You can see a lot of these septa and mycelia and so on and so forth. And this is called the methanamine silver stain of the same uh, from sinus. You can see these fungal uh, silver, silver stain, um, uh, fungal bodies and so on and so forth. So these are mucin. So a little bit of histopathology for you there, or the histopathologist there. So what is the antifungal therapy? As I said, you know, it's, it's very, very chronic infection. You need to give prolonged antifungals up to six weeks. I have seen in some, some articles up to 30 weeks, they say give. So six weeks is 24, you know. And then um, you can give uh, amphotericin B, uh, the polyene, amphotericin B is a drug of choice. Essentially the liposomal amphotericin B, which is in the, within liposomal, which is slow releasing. Then, uh, uh, amphotericin B is nasty for kidneys. You need to give kidney functioning, very, very important for these patients. And uh, uh, then after amphotericin B, you have to switch to uh, azole uh, group of drugs for, uh, these are the isvacanozole or posacanozole for a few more weeks. And uh, at the end of the day, you might have to have surgical intervention to remove the chronic infective focus because at the end of the day, inside the center of the sinuses, you can't get uh, the, the obviously into the air, you can't get antifungus into the, the air, thin air of the sinuses. So prevention, uh, they are saying is like for dentistry, from dental point of view, maintaining good oral hygiene in these patients, uh, routine ma 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 mouth mouthwashes, uh, chloroxidine mouthwash possibly. Uh, it is important that because these guys, these spores are land on everything, you know. Uh, keep a new, get, get uh, toothbrush, toothbrush hygiene has to be important. Uh, toothbrush should be disinfected routinely or the uh, using antiseptic mouthwashes. So these are routine measures, nothing much. So prevention, it's impossible to prevent breathing fungal spores. There is no vaccine or anything for mucomycosis. Personal hygiene is important. Uh, and they say if you are compromised or if you are post-COVID, do not go into dusty areas or construction sites. So if you are post-COVID, you might have still some kind of immunological deficiency. Def deficiency. So avoid activities that has direct contact with dust or soil, wear gloves, long shoes, and so on if you are doing that. Uh, clean skin injuries with warm water. Uh, so be careful if your immune system is affected due to any uh, reason. So again, this is 
kind of emphasizing what I said, control blood sugar, clean mask, personal hygiene, take only medications given by physicians, don't self-medicate with steroids and so on and so forth. So uh, what is the role of a dentist in the case of plaque fungal disease? If you are suspecting, uh, you need to get a good history of previous COVID infection and hospitalization. Look out for the signs and symptoms I mentioned earlier, quite a lot of them, you know, facial swelling, orbital swelling, pain, uh, uh, and then uh, redness, blackness. Uh, investigation CT is important, MRI and biopsy. Uh, you can, of course, give analgesics and anti-inflammatory uh, things and then uh, send for referral to OMFS and so on and so forth. Good keep, uh, keep good records and counsel the patients to stay calm and follow the instructions. So these are my last uh, few slides. Um, the other systemic mycosis, as I said, was aspergillosis. You know, so we covered the white fungus, candidiasis, the black fungus, mycomycosis. The aspergillosis doesn't have a, a specific name, but I don't have too many. I don't want to bore you with too many slides because aspergillosis is has so far. I have not seen a single. A case report of aspergillosis in the orofacial region uh, in the case of COVID. Aspergillosis is found in HIV patients, in AIDS patients, in those who are uh, uh, severely immunocompromised. So, so as I said, this is one slide with regard to aspergillosis. This is usually associated with severe illness and death. Um, so it is pulmonary, this is a pulmonary disease, uh, aspergillosis. So it's called CAPA. Uh, COVID associated pulmonary uh, aspergillosis, um, like CAM is COVID associated mucomycosis. So, uh, so the recent reports describe uh, pulmonary aspergillosis without a weakened system. Uh, usually, patients with severe COVID 19, particularly on ventilators and ICUs. And this is a very, very important point, ladies and gentlemen. You know, the ventilators and ICUs, you know, you are pumping in the air, you know, if the air, there are some defects in this, you are pumping in possibly all these spores into your, into, into your patient's lungs. So, so these are ventilator hygiene is critical for these in infections, uh, to prevent these infections. So, uh, so again, difficult diagnosis due to non-specific symptoms. Um, usually requires a specimen from deep in the lungs. So uh, last two or three slides, my conclusions. Um, so, uh, so with regard to COVID-19 associated mycosis, early diagnosis and treatment like to, for managing all mycosis, the black ones or the white ones or the red ones or whatever. So, so clinicians should consider the possibility of mucomycosis in patients with severe COVID-19 even when the patients lack classical risk, risk factors for disease, such as uh, diabetes and you know, immunocompromised situations and cancers and so on. So the treatment, as I said, just to recap, is aggressive surgical intervention in the final stages. Otherwise, the patient definitely going to die through, uh, candid uh, for, through, through uh, systemic infection and treatment with, with aflatoxin B, posaconazole, and suaconazole. And with regard to candida auris, um, you have to be careful that uh, there, there are be a lot of prolonged patient colonization and environmental persistence. You have to be careful about the environment if you are working in a uh, hospital situation. And, um, and because these guys are drug resistant, and they, you can carry these in the skin and skin if, you are, if your personal hygiene is not very good, particularly those who are working in clinics and hospitals. So you need to keep very good skin hygiene. So, uh, so the, uh, finally, coming back to oral manifestations, like uh, mostly seen in a severe case of COVID-19, uh, most common are the pseudomembranous and erythematous variants. And uh, you need to be aware of candida auris. And uh, this is, I hope, those of you who are not aware, you got something out of this today. Uh, uh, so these, some of these, uh, you know, first line polyene, uh, polyenes are good. Then you have to, otherwise you have to give azoles. Uh, mucomycosis, the, the, the black fungus, you have to give systemic liposomal amphotensis B. And of course, you know, these are, although the, the, COVID is about, you know, more than one and a half to two years old. 
uh, one and a half rather, um, we are seeing fortunately less and less, uh, not too many oral manifestations as opposed to previous uh, infections like uh, pandemics such as HIV and so on and so forth. So more data is warranted and if you see cases, please report them. And then so that, you know, uh, we can actually make a picture, create a picture of fungal infections associated with COVID-19. So uh, final, my slide uh, is that, you know, I would like to thank again, once again, uh, Professor Ranganathan and uh, the secretary and the Association for the Kind Mutation, um, and also uh, Professor Tilakratna for the kind introduction. So may all I have to say is good luck, be safe, vaccinate, and thank you so much. Thank you. This is the Queensland uh, campus, the Senate buildings where I was the dean for three years. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for, the, for such a thought provoking. Am I audible? Yes, yeah. 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 So you can stop the uh, slide share. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, sir, for the insightful session. It was really thought provoking. Thank and it's you. a Saturday afternoon, really well spent. And uh, we have uh, people who've logged in from a uh, lot of places, including somebody from Argentina. Wow. So, uh, yeah, and from Pan Asia, there are a lot of people. And uh, we now go on to the uh, a very, very interesting part of any session, and that is the interactive session. And with your permission, sir, could I um, uh, ask you the member questions that yeah, yeah of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, 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 I will not pretend to be the expert in everything, you know, because these are breaking infections. But I will yes, do my sir. best from what I know to ask, respond to all the questions and queries, because I have been reading a lot of, uh, as you can imagine. <laughs> so, and I have not, frankly, I have not seen any of these black fungus patients, and some of the. The, the audience may have seen this patient, but I'll be more than happy to share, possibly they can share their knowledge with us and, and then it will be a good interactive session. So. so the first question is from Dr. Anand Ramanathan. He's from Malaysia. So the question is, um, can we know the investigation for identification of C. auris, Candida auris? Sorry, can, uh, can you repeat the question, please? He wants to know the investigations for Candida auris. Okay, so Canada auris, as I said, will come up in the usual Sabarat Sega as just like uh, Canada albicans, right? So you need to have a great um, uh, degree of suspicion that if the patient is COVID, it could be Canada auris having COVID-19. Um, and, uh, you know, the Canada auris being a new, new organism, and uh, as I said, 2009, there are no a uh, lot of biochemical tests uh, which are used for Canada auris. Actually, they actually uh, camouflage other some of the other Candida species. So it's very very difficult to have biochemical tests as well. Even API, which is the system which we use for diagnostic uh, speciation of Candida, the, so uh, that, that doesn't come up with various. So I read recently read an uh, article where. We are, they are using uh, about 10 or 15 Canada Auris articles and Canada Auris strains and uh, other strains. And uh, it's very, very difficult to differentiate. For example, I think it's Canada Hansenula or something like that. It comes up like that. So the only way to is, uh, is, is PCR. And as I said, if you have Malditoff, Malditoff is a, is a, is a, is a you know, mass... Uh, uh, a light something I can't remember the acronym star for, um, uh, which is a, which is a very uh, specific instrument which is available in quite a quite a number of specialist spaces, um, uh, and uh, then the other one which uh, you have to do a PCR test which is you get specific uh, re uh, regions uh, which you can be uh, amplified and then you can give a definitive test so that is the only way you can do it but definitive uh, uh, identification it's it's a bit tricky I'm sorry. There is no easy way out for this fungus. Okay, so thank you so much. The next question is uh, from Argentina, from Professor Geronima Lassos. 
and he wants to ask you that why do you think there is a little percentage of candida oris infections in the oral cavity where usually candidiasis is pretty common so yeah so this is a good question um, it may be due to the fact that it is a new infection because it's not like for example candida albicans is present in uh, virtually 50 to 60% of uh, the population all over the world um in in different parts of the world so it's almost similar it ranges from 30 to 60% so candida oris being described in 2009 you saw the maps the the epidemiology and the distribution of candida oris is not common in other parts of the world at least until now so it's not probably not as common and hence you might not get this kind of uh, candida oris infections um you know as frequently as other candida infections like labrata or albicans or crucii or other ones um uh, so generally the, so that that may be the this is a speculative answer um i'm speculating here that may be one reason the other one reason is could be that a lot of people in the laboratories are identifying candida um albicans candida oris as candida albicans because when you culture it on sabarad segra they they appear absolutely the same because i have had seen a few species uh, candida oris strains in 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 uh, when i was working in uh, charja recently this last year uh, before the pandemic struck and they just grow like uh, you just simply can't differentiate on colonial appearance and on api test but i think in the fullness of time this api are uh, they are trying to produce a good test for candida oris so it will be the uh, the the you have to look, uh, watch out that space and i'm glad you are listening from argentina sir <laughs> so he had another question the same prof and he wants to know what are your thoughts about candida's role in oral carcinogenesis so a little insight and uh, uh, sorry candida carcinogenesis candida's yeah into oral carcinogenesis oh yeah i mean this is a age old question isn't it uh, it's been there for you know bugging us for the last 30 40 years i mean even when i was doing my phd people were asking why don't you do a chapter on that you know this is like the 30 40 years ago uh, nothing unfortunately nothing new has come out in that uh, uh, you know that that sphere uh it is uh, as scandinavians used to do uh, do a lot of uh, uh, this kind of work uh, because the canada produced uh, producers uh, metabolize such as nitrosoamines and so at one time that was the favor of the flavor of the month as it were so they were saying the nitrosoamine were pre carcinogenic and then you know we converted into um carcinogens uh, in in the oral cavity Uh, due to particularly uh, when you go from the hyperplastic you know 10 to 15% they say uh, become um, cancerous uh, carcinomatous and uh, in chronic lesions where where they are uh, there is uh, this nitrosoamine concentration um, uh, then you might get carcinoma developing so that may be the reason why in chronic hyperplastic candidiasis you get this kind of uh, um, uh, change into um uh, carcinomas and uh, squamous cell carcinomas but uh, so that is that as far as i know i am in touch with the literature i can say nothing new has emerged from that area unless somebody else knows i mean um uh, so that's that's what this uh, dr shiva preet okay sir so the next question is from dr sachin sorode he is from india and he wants to know whether there's any connection of mucor mycosis to the delta variant and the number of cases uh, like i don't know how would you know the number of cases reported in india so is there any connection of the variants with mucor mycosis not again i have not seen any reports of the delta variant and mucor mycosis or the black fungus um but i i mean uh, it's uh, it's i i i frankly do not think just because of its a delta variant that uh, it will become more uh, severe or infection so at the end of the day it's the 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 mucomycosis due to the overall depression of your immune system due to any kind of virus or um, um, so it could be the delta variant or it could be the original or alpha or beta or gamma 
um, so it i in my view that that i think that there will be no no variations even in the case of delta variant but well, i mean only time will tell about tell this and um, yeah, we we have to await more data on this thank you for the question Talking on that, uh, there's a question by Dr. Guru Raja Rao who wants to know if there's a relationship of anemia and the mucor infections. Anemia? Yeah, anemia and mucor infections. Uh, yeah, so I don't know. It's um, You get muco infections in hematological malignancy, but anemia, I don't call it a hematological malignancy or hematologic, uh, you know, to not to the, that kind of drastic situation. Um, again, uh, I know Dr. Guru Raj Rao very well, and uh, Dr. Rao, I, 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 I rather doubt it, but I think once you replenish your, you know, uh, your, you, uh, you know, anemic condition, uh, rather you improve your condition, things go back to normal. But I, 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 from what I hear, it's all in the very, uh, you know, classically very badly, uh, um, you know, when the immune system has been uh, badly affected, only uh, suppressed, yeah, they get it. Thank you, Dr. So, yeah, there, there are a lot of questions. So I think I'll take the last question. The rest we can uh, forward to you on your mail. And that question is, is there any relationship of change of, uh, you know, this, if the smell from the breath, does it uh, indicate a mucor mycosis? This is from uh, Rezat Abbas. So, Dr. Abbas, so is it, is, are you saying that with a smell can be used as a diagnostic type of thing? Well, I actually, so. yeah, this, uh, this, uh, I think that's a good point because when you go to the, uh, the kind of intermediate stage of uh, rhinocerebral uh, mucomycosis, when the sinuses are full of muco and there's a putrefying stuff there, you, as soon as the patient opens the mouth, you really get a bad smell. And this has been reported in a number of case reports. Um, and uh, and the, the, the breath is very smelly. Um, they don't describe what it is, but it's putrid smell, they say. It's like a decaying vegetation. At the end of the day, it's decaying. So they are, they are organically inside the uh, nose. They are, is the, the, the human tissue is being attacked by these the muco invasion of muco and so that is that is a good point thank you for that very good question so in the little bit of like before they come up as black black masses you know due to the formation of uh, you know due to the, the 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 blood supply issues before they become black you you will get a you know putrid smell from the mouth when they open the mouth and if you are close to the patient yeah that's a good question so, um, I mean, to end it all, there's one question which has just come now. Are there any recommendations on prevention of mucor mycosis? I think Sir's extensively talked about it in uh, his I presentation. This at the end, so, you know, you have to be yeah. very careful with your personal hygiene. If you're in a hospital situation, you are yes. in, a, in a rough, rough spot because these guys are lying all around you and they are, uh, they are resistant to disinfectants. So you'll have to start sampling from the top to bottom, as it were, you know, from the carpets or to the, the, the tabletops, to the, to the curtains and to the door handles and, and you name it. So environmental sampling is critical to find out where these things are lurking. And even the courts of assistance, unless they are uh, cleaned regularly and disinfected. I mean, we know that with the COVID situation, you know, people, all the hospitals are, you know, working at a breakneck uh, situation and uh, they don't, sometimes these things may lapse and that is a good opportunity for these fungi to multiply. Yeah. So um, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Lakshman. And then there are so many positive comments. So we'll forward them all to your mail. Yeah. And thank you for enlightening us today. And uh, now may I request Prof. Uh, Tilak Ratne for, uh, to give the concluding remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, yes. I, I, I'm sure the, the people from all around the world definitely must have enjoyed uh, Professor Samarnaka's talk. And we learned a lot of things. He uh, covered uh, all the areas that we were expecting him to cover. Right? He started with the introduction and then oral manifestations of COVID 
and then candida especially candida aureus that something that we didn't know much about and then mycosis and little bit on other species like aspergillus and so on now the take home message for oral manifestations of covid is there are no pathognomonic manifestations in the oral cavity to diagnose uh, covid but you can suspect because all the features that we described ulcers red patches black patches white patches erythema multiforme like lesions the vesicles the pustules blisters nectarian lesions etc they all are and taste sensation uh, changes serostomia they all are part and parcel of various other diseases so therefore you can suspect but you cannot diagnose covid by looking at these features right but you can be suspicious about uh, the covid when you see these lesions right so that's something important and also he gave us a very nice take home message on uh, where to suspect uh, mycosis uh, the in which group of patients the very old, very young very old and very sick so that's actually a very good thing that i have heard this earlier also from uh, Uh, him so that's very good thing and the the important information that we got about uh, candida auris because although it was described in 2009 we know how important it is for us to understand uh, the better because two third of the people if i remember correct uh, are killed due to uh, this is uh, this uh, specific candida species so therefore we need to be very careful and he very correctly said it's a silent pandemic and he showed us uh, how it has spread uh, from uh, one continent to the other and it has become a global problem uh, <clears throat> so then he said the difficulty in diagnosing uh, the uh, the candida auris because uh, with routine tests it is not possible and even saberud's ega will not give us uh, Uh, the diagnostic results and uh, i think uh, chromega i think if i remember correct he said it gives multiple colors so the, i don't know whether it will give you a clue and the diagnostic uh, test is either sequencing or uh, i'll say this multi top or something yeah multi yeah uh, so that uh, so we i i think we got i learned a lot about uh, candida aureus uh, by listening to you thank you very much and then the lastly you sp- he spoke about uh, mucomycosis as oral pathologist we all know we all have seen mucomycosis i'm sure as he correctly said we used to call it uh, zygomycosis i think i have seen at least 10 to 15 cases but they all we need to remember present as malignancies you will not get the diagnosis from a clinician saying deep fungal infection but they say malignancy because the clinical features are malignant looking so we need to culture them if we need to get the correct diagnosis and he uh, the, also said uh, you know this is a very uh, serious infection that we need to uh, diagnose because about almost 50 to 80% of them die so therefore it's very important for us to uh diagnose that early as he said early diagnosis is the key and the drugs especially the amphotericin b that we use is nephrotoxic and it is the duty of the clinician to uh the follow up with the renal profile so that's very important aspergillosis finally he touched upon and uh, aspergillosis as oral pathologists we know we all have seen enough aspergillosis in the maxillary antrum but they are mostly uh the very innocent lesions the benign lesions that's why we call them as fungus ball but uh, again as he correctly mentioned in immunocompromised patients you can get invasive forms uh, break in the antral walls and uh, intraorbital area etc and also he uh, lastly he mentioned about the role of the dentist uh, to complete it uh, so if we take this information what he said i'm sure we should be able to diagnose at least we have been diagnosis candida albicans regularly uh, as dentist but uh, uh, to support the diagnosis of covid candida auris and mucomycosis i think dentist have a role to play thank you very much uh, the, sam for the, the very informative lecture thank you, thank you. Uh, on behalf of asmp i would like to 
thank for this uh, wonderful lecture thank you very much thank you thank you very much thank you prof tilak and now i would like to request our honorary president uh, dr ranganathan for uh, to invite him for felicitation and honoring of the speaker and uh, for first uh, nijansh could you it team could i request you to share the screen yes. here it is thank you very so, much so uh, yeah and uh, may i now request uh, the it team to share uh, our chairperson prof tilak ratne's uh, certificate so, <laughs> yeah sharing the screen so now we all have to pose for the memory shot so first uh, the four of us and then the rest of the people will join in so nijansh can you put me on the spotlight too yeah so nijansh can you take a memory shot because this is a saturday afternoon very really well spent which will remember thank you so much and now may i uh, request uh, all the people who joined in today to put on their cameras and janch can you put everyone and we can take a memory shot for all the people who've logged in today okay if are we done nijansh i think we must be yep. so now yeah thank you so much nijansh so now we come to the end of a wonderful session and um, uh, i would like to uh, on behalf of professor k ranganathan honorary president of assam and the council i deem it a great pleasure and privilege to be given the duty or chance to say the customary vote of thanks would like to begin by extending a whole hearted thanks to Pro professor lakshman samarnaike for joining us today and deliberating on the pertinent topic of covid-19 and oral and systemic mycosis we are grateful prof lakshman for the extensive insight into systemic and oral fungal diseases the valuable update on the diagnosis and management of is relevant to the clinical dental practice today and it has indeed enriched us all today thank you prof lakshman for your time and for your expertise and sharing your expertise with all of us today i would fail in my duties if i do not thank the assam advisors prof rosna zan prof wm tilakratne and prof takashi takata for your constant guidance and support special thanks to assam counselors from different parts of asia who worked really hard in disseminating the knowledge and information about the webinar leading to huge numbers thank you everyone for your inputs i would also like to thank uh, the office and thanks a lot to our most uh, valued invited guests seniors colleagues and students i also extend my thanks to dr mandana donahue and nija for their inputs and also i would like to thank um, this opportunity to thank uh, nijansh from uh, speakin and um, mona singh for helping me with the logistics and everybody who's logged in today thank you so much and now uh, we would like to come uh, to the end of we've come to the end of the session so we would like to conclude the session and um, uh, goodbye everyone stay safe stay blessed and hopefully next time we would have more insights into the dreaded mycosis thank you so much thank you thank you Thank you.